blessing. How many are ready to get in the word this morning? That didn't sound great. That's... How many are ready to get in the word this morning? This morning, uh, it's, and, and listen, we are jumping back into our Back to Basics series. Uh, two weeks ago, we examined together the truth that Jesus is fully God and fully man, right? His divinity entered into our humanity. In just a few months, actually less than that now, uh, we're going to be celebrating the Christmas season, the incarnation, divinity entering humanity. It's going to be an awesome time. This week, I want us to continue to set our eyes upon Jesus, and specifically in relation to his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much we have an opportunity to come and engage with your word. Lord, that this... this uh, sermon isn't so much a sermon as it is a teaching. And Lord, I ask that it would stay in our hearts. It would cause us to think. It would cause us to pray. It would cause us to understand where you're leading us. Lord, it would cause us to understand the voices of those who are trying to lead us away from you. Lord, I pray that we have discernment. I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks clearly to us and keeps us on the right path. In Jesus' name, amen. Say, Pastor David, that was kind of an interesting prayer about the message. What is this message going to be about specifically? Uh, we want to talk about the basics of our faith. What are the basics of what we believe? We can point to his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. We can point to these things with confidence, amen? When we speak about the basic belief of Christians in relation to Jesus, we can say with certainty he was born of a virgin. He died on a cross. He rose again. He is coming back in glory. For the most part, even though we in the body of Christ may disagree on some issues, how many know in the body of Christ sometimes there's disagreement? Right? When it comes to the basics of Christianity, the basics of Christ, a lot of times we find unity. Amen? We want there to be unity and agreement when it comes to the issues surrounding who Christ is, his death, his life, his resurrection, his birth, amen? It's true that some of the issues that are in the church are large enough issues to separate us into what we call denominations. Okay, so there's things about uh, the Baptist faith that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. There's things about the, uh, let's say, Lutheran or Catholic faith that we would just, there's, there's, differences. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the unity of Jesus. But we also would look at these things and say those things are minors versus majors. Okay, so there's people that call themselves Baptists that are in the service this morning. I go, that's great. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We can go, to, go, go down to Grandview. We could go through their doors and enjoy a service with them. And we can enjoy service with brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? How many know that to be true? Right? We can go down to, to the Lutheran church or the Catholic church. We can go down to uh, various churches around the area. And not everybody in those churches, but some people in those churches would be a part of the body of Christ. Just like when we come into this building, not everybody in the building is part of the body. You say, oh, uh oh. What that means is there's some people that claim Christ, live through Christ, live by Christ, and they're doing it genuinely, and then there are some people who are faking it. That's just the genuine nature of things. Some people have made Jesus Lord of their life, and some people have not. We should never forget that if we believe in and follow Jesus Christ as he is revealed in the Bible, that we are members of the body, whether you go to this church or you go to the church down the road. Now, it is important, and honestly, uh, probably in six weeks or so, I will eventually get to preach on the unity of believers in Christ. And that's going to be the end of this series. Because the truth is this, while it may seem clear that these events, and by these events, I want to speak clearly here, his birth his life, his death, his resurrection, his return in glory. 
When we speak about the very basics of our faith, we're not talking about Calvinism versus Arminianism. We're not talking about things within the body that are slight arguments or things that divide us. That We're not talking about whether or not you can have alcohol or not. We're not talking about any of those types of things. We're talking about the basics of Christ. Born of a virgin, did miracles in his life, died on a cross, rose again, is coming back in glory. It may seem clear to many people that these events have been tested and retested and challenged and rechallenged, but how many know there's always a new trick from the enemy? There's always new tricks from the enemy. There's always new schemes to cause believers to get tripped up in their faith. If you were to go to the FCA website, if you could go to the FCA website, uh, we see a list of seven items about the, the life, birth, death, resurrection of Jesus and you, there's a good chance you can't see those because they're very small. And so what I did for you was, go to the next slide. Um, I made them quite large for you. So we believe in his virgin birth. We believe in his sinless life. We believe in his miracles. We believe in his vicarious and atoning death through his shed blood. We're going to take communion later on today. We believe in the cross. Amen. We believe in his bodily resurrection. We believe in his ascension to the right hand of the Father. We believe in his personal return in power and in glory. Amen? Now, I'm not going to preach in depth about every one of these things today, all of these seven items. Most, if not, have been preached, I would say, ad nauseum within the church. Over the last six and a half years, I've preached on these things multiple times. But remember that this is a back-to-basics series. So while I will not be touching on every subject, I also want to get into the ways that the enemy is attacking our faith in Christ, especially in relation to these items. The teaching today is not so much about going verse by verse or line by line. The teaching today is about an understanding of the importance of truth. How many know truth is important? We need truth, especially in today's culture. Truth matters. We believe without a a doubt that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Why? Because we see that clearly in Scripture. It is an essential of our faith. Where do we see that? We're going to start in Matthew 1, verse 18. It says this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, that is, before they were together sexually, before they were together as man and woman, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1.18. Now, if you were to look at the account found in Luke, we would see the response from Mary when the angel informs her of her upcoming pregnancy. She says this, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? It's clear in Luke, in Matthew, that she is presented as a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, this is a beautiful story that is always a blessing to share around the Christmas time, right? So I'm not going to go through all of it this morning, but it's important to understand that the virgin birth is not just a cool story. It's important to understand that the virgin birth is not just a side story, but Jesus born of a virgin is of vital importance in relation to the core of what we believe. It is vital in Christianity. There should not be a mistake made here, and I need to listen to this carefully. There should not be a mistake. To deny the virgin birth is to deny the word of God. It is to deny that Jesus is divine. It is to deny the authenticity of scripture itself. In other words, the virgin birth is the branch that we're all standing on. Amen? It is the branch that we are all standing on. About 20 years ago now, excuse me, about 20 years ago, There was a church plant that was happening in West Michigan, near the city that I grew up in. So what was happening was this really hip and trendy pastor. Uh, Man, he was a vibrant guy, big ideas, big personality. He was building a church, and involved in that church were friends of mine. So personal friends of mine were involved with that church, and it was a church plant that had the backing of another big and influential ministry in the area. 
So the first service, a thousand people showed up. A thousand people in the very first service. They call it, and they don't even call it a service, they call it their gathering. This is our gathering. Within a couple of years, they had around 6,000 people attending every Sunday. They had two services, about 3,000 people each. The pastor's name was a guy named, by the name of Rob Bell. How many know who that is? Some people may know who that is. Some people may not, and that's okay. Not only did the church explode with growth, the influence of Rob Bell did as well. One newspaper referred to him, actually it was the Chicago, uh, Chicago Tribune, referred to him as the next Billy Graham. He wrote books, he did video series that were hip and they were trendy and they were swallowed up by Christians. Man, I'm telling you, swallowed up by Christians around the world. Now, the truth is this. The initial teachings and the concepts of these videos, they were, they were interesting, they were biblical, they were sound for the most part, right? But the problem was this. What started out as a solid ministry soon became spiritually toxic. In the, series, uh, in the teaching series called NUMA, it was a video series that he put out that became very popular among youth groups and churches. In fact, there was uh, video, videos of NUMA were here at this church when I first came. And some of the videos were fine. Some of the videos were, were fine, biblical, scriptural, no issue. But then he began to teach about weird things. One of the weird things that he taught was about Peter walking on water. How many know the story? Right? Peter's on the boat. Jesus is walking on the water. They think it's a ghost. He says, come out to me. Peter walks out on the water. He starts to doubt. And he starts to sink. Jesus looks at him and pulls him back up. He says, why did you doubt? Now, in throughout church history, we've always seen and always known that Peter's faith was in Christ. And that's why he was able to step out of the boat and walk on the water. But this pastor, he began to teach that Peter walking on water was not because of his faith in Christ, but because of his faith in himself. And so Bell's teachings began to sound more and more like heresy than it sounded like orthodoxy. Now, what's heresy? What's orthodoxy? We're going to get into that here in just a second. Why? Because I lost my spot and I need to find it. Orthodoxy, in case you're not sure, is the basics of what we believe. It is what's necessary for genuine Christianity. It's what's necessary. We're going to go through a few things. I'm going to go through very fast verses, but let's go through them. Christ alone conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, Matthew 1.18. We just went through that. Christ alone is God incarnate, John 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, Philippians 2.5, 1 Timothy 2.5. You say, Pastor David, you're speaking too fast for me to take notes. That's why we have YouTube, so you can watch it again and take the notes yourself. Christ, lived, Christ alone lived a sinless life, 2 Corinthians 2.21, Hebrews 4.15. Christ alone died a penal substitutionary death, Isaiah 53, 4, Romans 3, 21. Christ alone rose from the dead, triumphant over sin, Acts 2, 22, Romans 4, 25. Those statements are orthodoxy, absolute truth. Heresy is to preach a lie and call it truth. How many of you know there's a lot of people preaching lies out there and calling it truth today, Right? This isn't a new phenomenon in the church. In fact, it's an old trick. Uh, that's mostly what the enemy does. He has old tricks wrapped up in new packaging. So around 20 to 30 years after the early church, Jesus has ascended to heaven. 20 to 30 years later, Peter is in a prison in Rome awaiting his execution. And what was happening in the early church was there was false teachers, false prophets that were rising up and they were proposing to the people that since Jesus hadn't returned in the last 20 to 30 years, it's likely he's not coming back at all. So Peter, from the prison cell, waiting to be executed, writes this. In 2 Peter 2, verse 1 through 3, it says this. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. 
They will secretly introduce destructive heresies or lies, even, den even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Don't go to the next slide yet. There's a danger that we have as believers in that when we see Scripture or hear the Bible, there's times where we tune out. Or there's times where we look at it as an ancient manuscript. We look at it as, wow, that's the Bible. That's great. But what does that apply? how does that apply to us today? I want you to imagine that it's not Peter writing this to you. But it's a friend that you know personally. A Bible believer, a Christian, a friend. He writes this letter to you, and in the letter he writes, listen, there are people lying to you. You need to wake up. They will introduce destructive heresies. You don't understand. These aren't just lies. These are destructive lies. I am your friend. I am, part, I am over this body, and I'm telling you, there are destructive lies being told to you. And so this friend writes you this letter, and now you don't see it as just, well, it's the Scripture, it's the Bible, it's an ancient manuscript. You say, man, this was written to me. And so now we take it personally, right? Peter says there's false prophets, there's false teachers, people who say that they're Christian and they are not, people who say they are prophets of the Lord and they are not, people say that they are teachers and they are not, they are liars. They will introduce themselves secretly, denying that the Lord bought them, denying that the Lord paid the price for them. I like what the uh, message translation reads, or how it paraphrases this. It says this. Go to the next slide. Sorry, keep going. Go one more. Oh, boy. I messed up. Here we go. Go back. Yeah, there. There it was. Uh, there. Find it. It says this. But there were also lying prophets among you. Just as there will be lying religious teachers among you, they'll smuggle in destructive divisions, pitting you against one another. There it is. Biting the hand of the one who gave them a chance to have their lives back. Biting the hand of the very one who gave them a chance to have their lives back. They've put themselves on a fast downhill slide to destruction, but not before they recruit a crowd of, listen to this, mixed up followers who can't tell right from wrong. Christians with no discernment. People that claim Christ, but they don't know right from wrong. And people will say, well, I know some of those people. And some people will be honest and say, I've sometimes been one of those people. In the book Velvet Elvis, Rod Bell described the doctrines of the church. And he described them as springs on a trampoline. How many have ever jumped on a trampoline? All right. How many jump? How many? How many have? How many jumped on the trampoline in the last week? Any kids? No. Any, how many? How many in the last six months? Peg, you jumped on a trampoline in the last six months. Awesome. I did too. I didn't so much jump as I fell, and I didn't so much jump as I sank. The kids were there. They know. He described the doctrines of the church as springs on a trampoline. And he tries to make his point about doctrines not being about God. The teachings not being about God. But merely springs that help us jump on the trampoline of our faith in God. It sounds pretty good at first, right? Man, it's kind of a cool analogy. Sounds, sounds pretty, that's interesting. Then he went further. His words. 
What if tomorrow someone digs up definitive proof that Jesus had a real earthly father named Larry? And archaeologists find his tomb and did DNA samples. They, they prove without a shadow of a doubt the virgin birth was just a myth. <coughs> what if the spring was seriously questioned? Could a person keep jumping on that trampoline? Could you still be a Christian? That was Rob Bell asking that question. Let me start by giving an answer to that question. No. Absolutely not. If we find out tomorrow that Matthew and Luke were just liars, that's not a trampoline worth jumping on. Let me say it very clearly here. If we find out the virgin birth is a lie, that means that Jesus was only a man. He was not God. He is not sinless. His death on the cross meant nothing. If his death means nothing, then the faith is void. I am taking my ball and I am going home. You know what I mean? How many remember Charlie Brown and Lucy? How many remember she had that football? And every time Charlie went to kick it, what'd she do? She yanked it away. That's what the enemy does every time. Right when you're about to kick that ball. Whoa, whoa, I see something new. I see something shiny. I'm going to grab a hold of it. Wow, this is a new truth. This is a new revelation. This is a new take. This is a new perspective. Make no mistake. The virgin birth is the branch we are all standing on. To present the idea that the truth of Scripture is not necessary for, for, for following Jesus is heresy. It's a lie. One minister said it this way, by failing to insist on a literal virgin birth as part of what is necessary to believe, Rob Bell has taken the well-traveled well road of liberalism. It seems clear that the Jesus Rob Bell claims to follow is in reality a different Jesus. You say, what do you mean a different Jesus? Look up 2 Corinthians sometime. Look at 2 Corinthians and hear what Paul talks about in reference to a second Jesus. We're not going to get into that right now or another Jesus. There are some people who claim to follow Jesus, and in reality, they're not following Jesus of the Bible. They're following another Jesus. We talked about Mormonism a couple of weeks ago, or last week, a couple of weeks ago. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. These are people who follow another Jesus. It is not Jesus of the Bible. It is not truth of Scripture. It is a lie from the pit of the enemy. It will lead people to destruction. It will lead people to hell. And you say, Pastor David, I know Mormons. I know Jehovah's Witnesses. They are some of the nicest people in the world, and they are very nice and incredibly deceived. And we love them. We care for them. We preach truth to them. But how many know we can't change what people think? Right? How many have ever tried to change somebody's mind? I have. How many know it's almost fruitless? Right? I mean, if somebody really believes that this chair is black, I mean, they really, with all their heart, just, yeah, it's black. And I go, what is this, pink, salmon, whatever? I'm trying to, I'm trying to convince them, what, are you blind? And then they go, well, yeah. Because they would have to be blind. blind of some sort. And that's the truth of it, is a lot of times the people that you're trying to get to see the truth will not be able to see the truth, simply because they are blind. And until the Holy Spirit moves upon them, takes the scales off their eyes, the door is open for them to be, only then will they see the truth. Now, let's talk about the controversy with Rob Bell, the virgin birth. Most of this happened before 2012. He left the church that he founded. He joined the Oprah Winfrey Network, which is perfect, uh, considering the heresy that comes out of that group. See, Bell was part of a group of pastors and teachers that were called emergent or progressive, or liberal, 
or postmodern. These would include the likes of Brian McLaren, Doug Paget, Tony Jones, Richard Rohr, Jen Hatmaker, the late Rachel Held Evans, and the like. Now, for most of the people out here in Christian, the Christian world, they never heard of those people. Some people have, some people haven't. But there should be an awareness that there is a toxic poison that is trying to seep into the church, and we need to know how to combat it in the name of Jesus. Not only are the majority of those names I just mentioned, a majority are homosexual marriage and lifestyle affirming. What they like to do is they like to pit Jesus against the Apostle Paul in scriptures, and then they would deny a literal hell. They say, oh no, God would never do that. They don't understand the travesty, the devastation, the destruction of sin. There was a leader within the emergent movement. He was, he was explaining the essence of the movement. This is really interesting. He's explaining the essence of the movement, what it's all about, and he did so with a parable. There were once two rabbis. They were arguing back and forth about a passage in the Torah. They argued back and forth. One person saw it this way. Another, another rabbi saw it this way. For 20 years... They argued back and forth, back and forth. God is up there listening for 20 years going, oh my goodness, what? One rabbi had his idea of what it was, and then later on he changed his idea of what it was, and then it changed again. And the other rabbi said, well, I might have agreed with you early on, but now it changed again. Now I have a different perspective. Now I, now I have a different argument. 20 years back and forth like cats and dogs, and finally God says, you know what? I am going to just tell them exactly what it means. I'm sick of the arguing. So God divides the heavens. He comes down to earth. He sees the two rabbis. And he says, this is what it means. I'm sick of your arguing. And they looked at him and said, what is it? Your business why don't you just go back where you came from? We're going to continue arguing. Sounds like a pretty messed up story, right? But this is the story that was told by the emergent leader as the essence of what they are as a group. <laughs> the leader said, what he loved about this parable is that it wasn't God's view or the right interpretation that was important, but that we were engaging in dialogue and that we were arguing about it. That's what was important. Not what God has to say about it, not the correct interpretation, but it's almost as if, and this is what they say, the Bible is a piece of art and however you interpret it is how it is. What's important is not that you interpret it correctly. What's important is not that you get the right answer, but that you engage with it. That's coming from the leadership of these movements. Progressive, postmodern, emergent, liberal, Christianity. Having truth is not important. Biblical authority is not important. Correct interpretation is not important. There is no absolute. I love that argument. It's the dumbest one there is. There is no absolute. There's a big hole in that argument if anybody caught on. For them to say there's absolutely no absolute is an absolute. It's not logical, it's not reasonable, it's truthless, it's senseless, it's directionless. What started with some pastors and teachers embracing theological liberalism has now shifted into an old movement that's gaining new traction. The encouragement now is not just to question absolute truth. Don't just question it. It seems the goal is to bring the whole thing down. Brick by brick. We're going to bring the whole building down with what is called, and this is the new word for it, 
It used to be called postmodernism, used to be called emergent, used to be called liberal, used to be called these different things. Now it's referred to as Christian deconstructionism. Say, Pastor David, what is that? Christian deconstruction is an encouragement to look at every aspect of your faith and tear it down. Now initially, and I want to say initially, the goal was to then build up a more solid foundational faith. There's nothing wrong. How many know there's, there, there's times where we examine what we believe and why, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with looking historically, scripturally. We want to make sure we're reading things in context. We want to make sure that we're strong foundationally, amen? There's nothing wrong with that. But what happened was rather than build anything back up, what they did was they, they found it was easier just to leave the rubble where it was. There's a pastor. His name is Josh Harris. He was a well-known pastor and author. In 2019, he announced that he was going to be leaving Christianity altogether. He'd been a pastor for well over 20 years. He had a large congregation. He said, I have undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is called deconstruction. The biblical phrase is called falling away. By all the measurements, measurements I have for defining a Christian, he said, I am not a Christian. You see, the postmodern emergent examination of Christian faith has now given way to an outright and an acceptable tearing down of one's faith. So you saw that from Pastor Josh Harris. You would see that from Marty Sampson from Hillsong. You see that from other church leaders. How many know who Rhett and Link are? How many know Good Mythical Morning? If you know what that is, you know, I mean, there's some people that would know that. Uh, very influential in the millennial generation and... What's, what's after millennial, Austin? Young people. He said Gen Z. I'm going to say those, the youngsters, which sounds really old. Rhett and Link uh, have this channel on YouTube, very popular, very, very big, very out there. A lot of influence. Claimed to be good, God-loving Christians until last year where they put out why they were no longer Christians. We can't agree with God's view on homosexuality. We can't agree with God's view on LGBT issues. We can't agree with God's issues on women. And so in that regard, we can't agree with God. And we are no longer Christian. We are exploring To study the hard questions of faith with the intent to grow is a good thing. But when the examination of the Word of God is subject to the culture, rather than the culture being subject to the Word of God, that's where you get in trouble. If the examination of the Scripture is subject to culture, culture is going to win every time. Josh McDowell was asked about what uh, biblical authority meant for him. If you know Josh McDowell, he has for years evidence that demands a verdict. He has written numerous books on apologetics and what it means to believe in the Bible. Biblical authority means having the Bible as the source of your worldview. It means trusting God to provide the, the answers to the big questions in life, such as where right and wrong come from. In reality, the Bible is not really the source of morality itself. Nothing is right and wrong just because the Bible says it. For instance, lying is not wrong because the Bible says thou shalt not lie. Rather, the Bible says we should not lie because God is truth. The character of God is the foundation of right and wrong. And this is revealed through the scriptures. Consider another example. Killing is not wrong just because the Bible says killing is wrong. Rather, the Bible, because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. But the reason it says this is because God is life in his very character, and we are made in his image. Most people prioritize their feelings today rather than biblical truth. I, I don't know if I can get amen in there. Most people, including people who call themselves Christians, prioritize their feelings today rather than biblical truth. And even in the church. Even in the church, we've allowed 
a new definition of tolerance to relegate the Bible to second place. Why? Because we have to look and say, well, am I going to get canceled for this? Could I get canceled for this? Cancel me. Go ahead. Lock me in a cell. Throw away the key. There are people who call themselves Christians who say they love the Lord. That when they are faced with the Bible or their job, they pick their job. When they are faced with the Word of God or security, they pick security. When the time comes where we are told, deny Jesus or die, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to see my master. I don't look upon it with dread. I don't look upon it with fear. I don't look upon it with clammy hands and, clammy hands and, and oh, no, what's going to happen? I look upon it with joy. I really do. The darkness is going to get darker. The world is going to get worse. It's just where it's going. Listen, there will be a time where the school system is going to be the enemy of God. You say, some people say it already is. And I would say, thankfully, we have good Christian people who are in the school system trying to prevent that. We really do. If you don't know, ELC has some awesome Christian leadership and the surrounding school districts. I don't want to leave anybody out. There's awesome Christian leadership. Guess what? There's also some awful leadership. Ungodly, unholy, postmodern, liberal leaning, gay marriage affirming, pro abortion affirming, leaders and teachers. Jenny and I have talked about this. There may be a come a time. There may come a time where we do an uh, in-church homeschool group and just, you can't go to public school? Come here. Come here. We'll open up the building. You say, Pastor David, when is that coming? I don't know. I pray it's not coming for years and years and years. Why? Because I am praying that people are given every opportunity they can to get right with Jesus. Every opportunity. But Listen, and I am not fear-mongering here. I am telling you the truth of what's coming. There is something coming down the line. Christians are going to be persecuted in, a, in this country in a way that you have never seen. And I believe where it will lead to imprisonment, imprisonment and even death. I really believe that's coming. I don't know when. I'm not trying to scare anybody. In fact, you shouldn't be. But do you have the confidence in Scripture? Do you have confidence in Jesus Christ and who he is in your life? Is he second in your life or is he first? Has he been relegated to just sit in the back or is he in the driver's seat? How many ever looked at that stupid bumper sticker that said, Jesus is my co-pilot? Remember that stupid thing that was like, I always thought, why isn't he your pilot? Somebody posted something on Facebook the other day. I don't remember who. If it was you, it is what it is. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to tell you exactly what it was. And it said, you can be offended, but this is what I believe in. I believe in, and it went down the list, and it said, President Trump, I believe in gun rights. I believe in all all the GOP hot-button issues, right? 
And then at the very end said, I also believe in God. And I thought, man, you need to flip that list, man. You need to flip that list. Why? Because if God is not first on the priority, and I'm telling you what, if he's been relegated to second place, if the Bible has been relegated to second place in your life, when the trials come, and I believe they will, when the persecution comes, and I believe it will, when the culture challenges you, and I believe it already is, you're going to find out where you stand really quick. And then you have to have a hard talk to yourself. You have to have a heart-to-heart with the Lord. You have to get to an altar. You have to pray. You have to get to an understanding of I either believe in this or I don't. It's become a place in what we would call the theological liberal what we would call really theological poison. Whether you call it emergent, postmodern, liberalism, it's become a place where you're never supposed to question somebody's beliefs, values, lifestyle, or truth claims. Because if they do, you're being shamed. How many know that they have taken words and change the meanings of them. There is a there is a comedian, uh, talk show host who really has uh, it's pretty stupid in most everything else he says. But and I mean this honestly, he was talking about how we change the meaning of words. How many know the word shame has taken on an entirely different meaning? To say if somebody is uh, large, overweight, like myself. To point that out was called fat shaming. How many know that's true? Right? It's not, well, we're trying to help you be healthy. We're trying to make sure you have a healthy lifestyle, make sure you live longer, make sure you don't croak while you're preaching. If they point it out in any way, that's fat shaming. If they point to a girl who has multiple boyfriends and sleeps around and has a reputation of that, Listen, I'm going to use the word, and you guys all know what it is. You can't say anything about that. Because that is called slut-shaming. Yeah, that's a real word. You say, Pastor David, can you say that in church? Why not? You say it outside the church. Oh, you can't do that. And I understand there's different issues and circumstances where that, that girl may be a victim, maybe. There are all sorts of different circumstances. I understand that. But listen to this. They have taken the word and said you should no longer be ashamed. You should no longer be ashamed. You can eat what you want. You can sleep with who you want. You can do what you want. You can do whatever makes you feel good. You need to live your truth. And if anybody comes against that, then they're the bigot. They are the ones who need to be shamed. When we preach the truth of God's word, we cannot afford to change the meaning of words. I mean this honestly. Why? Because there are some things in this world that we do that are shameful. And it should be called for what it is. There are some things that the Bible calls sinful. That should be called for what it is. How many know the importance of standing up for truth in an age where it's lie after lie after lie after lie? Listen, you can be shouted down. They can try to shout you down. They can try to cancel you. They can try to mess you up. But I refuse to shut up. I refuse to shut up. Uh, Another way of saying it is this. Let your light shine. How many remember that little hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. 
I'm going to let it shine. There was a, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of cheesy, kind of funny. That's an important truth. I just spit on somebody. I don't know who, but they're in this vicinity. You got wipers next time. How many have a light to shine this morning? I want to end this sermon not with my words. But we started off the message with seven truths about Jesus. His virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, vicarious death, atoning, vicarious atoning death through his shed blood. In his bodily resurrection, in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, his personal return in power and glory, these truths are essential to our faith. But we can't just claim to believe it. How many know we have to live it? We can't just say, yeah, I believe it. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. This is what I believe. We have to live it. If you can't get excited at who Jesus is and what he's done for you and his return, if you can't get excited at that, you might want to check your spiritual pulse. You say, man, yeah, yeah, I know, Jesus come back. What? If you can't get excited at the return of Christ, if you can't get excited about who he is and what he's, in, what he's doing in your life right now, if you can't get excited about those things, just go, yeah, I'm a Christian man. Well, why? Because I go to church. Because I was baptized when I was a baby. Because I go to a building that says church on it. That does not make you a Christian. Going to a building does not make you a Christian. Sleeping in a garage does not make you a car. Amen? I want to end this morning not with my words, but with the words of Jesus. And I want you to remember as I read these words, these are not just, well, yeah, it's Bible, it's ancient manuscript. It's, these are the words of Christ to us. The words of God the Father speaking to us. The words through his Son for our edification, for our Christian journey. If you would stand with me this morning. I pray that his words would guide you this morning. They're found in Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to start in verse 13. And it says this. Enter through the narrow gate. I actually want to stop and preach on that. I'm not going to, but I want to. The words of Jesus, very clear. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes and figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, Imagine that Jesus is not just speaking through the, the, the Bible and the words here, but he's speaking to you personally. He is in your face personally, saying, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. 
and the rain came down and the streams rose and the, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Go to the next slide. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who has built his house upon the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and they beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. This morning, I'm going to ask you, what is your foundation? Is your house built upon a rock? Or is it built on sand? And only you can answer that. I'd like you to all close your eyes. You say, Pastor David, why, why close our eyes? Because this is a moment between you and God. This is a moment where you have to ask the question of yourself. What is my foundation? Am I built on the rock of Christ Jesus? Or is my faith built on shifting sand? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor David, I, I love the Lord. I love his word. I have a firm foundation. I'm so glad. But maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor David, I don't know. It seems like my foundation is sandy. I'm not sure. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Just say, I'm not sure. It's not firm. My faith isn't on a rock. If that's you, I, I saw some hands go up, but if you're, would you raise your hand this morning? Just keep it up for a minute. Let's all pray together. Lord, I thank you for your rock. Thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that I don't lean on my own understanding, but I lean on your promises. I lean on your everlasting word. Lord, I pray over those who are here this morning. I pray that their houses would be firm, their foundations would be solid, that our faith is found in Christ, that it's found in the word of God. I pray that we are firm in what we believe. Lord, I pray that you give us opportunity to minister to people around us at our jobs, in our schools. Opportunities as we go to the grocery store, as we go through the neighborhood. Let us be witnesses of your glory. Witnesses of your power, of your healing, of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, and I know we, it's almost noon, we're going to take communion together. We're going to engage in some worship together. And so here's what I would have you do. Uh, we're going to start with this side. And we're going to start from the back. And if you would, from the back, you're going to come through uh, the middle row, and then we're all going to gather up here together. So if from the back, you come this way, you'll start. And as each, each row comes, just uh, if you're over here, go around the back when they get done. And then if you're over here, start from the back and go this way and come over here. We're trying to streamline it. So ladies, if you would make your way forward, Jenny's going to lead us in some worship. And if you would start, Jonathan. 